These are in listen-only mode. Okay, everyone, it's 2 o'clock, time to begin the webinar. My name is Rob Altman, and I'll be your moderator for today's Harika webinar titled Golf Club Length, the Single Most Important Fitting Variable. The webinar will be led by Harika's Technical Director, Jeff Summit. Let me tell you a few words about Jeff. Jeff's worked in all facets of club making and repair since 1984 and has devoted the past 20 years to researching, testing, and analyzing thousands of different golf shams. He has compiled his findings and research into the Dynamic Shaft Fitting Index, which is featured in the best-selling book, The Modern Guide to Club Making, and Total Club Fitting in the 21st Century. Additionally, he has authored the annual Dynamic Shaft Fitting Addendum, which instructs club fitters in the proper fitting and selection of shafts. Both books are available for sale online at hericogolf.com. Let me get a few housekeeping items out of the way first. Your audio settings are muted, which means we cannot hear you. And if you have any questions, use the question box located in the upper right-hand corner of your dashboard. If for any reason you must leave the webinar, don't worry. It is being recorded and will be on youtube.com slash hericogolf and, and on our blog in about one to two hours. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Harico Golf Technical Director, Jeff Summit. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Rob. And more importantly, thank all of you uh, attending today's webinar on golf club length, the single most important fitting variable. One of the more often asked questions I get from golfers and club makers alike is, what length do I need? Or in the case of the club fitter, what length does my customer need? In this webinar, I'm going to address this complex issue and break it down. And at the same time, I want to explain why length is the single most important fitting variable and ground zero before you ever select the right components. Just like our last webinar was targeted toward finding the right type of grip and proper size one might need, this one will also focus on the fitting side to help determine what length might be correct. Here are a few things to consider. First, we all know golfers come in all different sizes and so too should their clubs. Secondly, before we can ever build a golf club, you have to know what length to make it first. For that matter, the end consumer really needs to know their length requirements before buying a new club. And finally, once you've determined length, then the rest of the pieces of the fitting puzzles start to fall into place. One of the first things we need to address is how club length is measured. After all, if you have clubs that fit you well, or one you've tried, then you need to know what length um, they are if you're trying to duplicate that for a new set. There are no standards, as we'll explain later, so knowing your driver length is 45 inches is universally adopted rather than saying it's a half inch long or short of standard because there's a lack of standards. This simply eliminates the confusion. So I want to briefly go over the method of measuring length I did back in our October 1st, 2009 length measuring webinar. I want to make absolutely sure our listeners today know how to properly measure length before going any further. And for those that already know, please bear with me just for a few moments. Length itself is measured by placing the club on the ground or in a template at the proper lie angle the manufacturer intended. Using the axis of the shaft, length is measured from the ground to the end of the grip cap. The next few uh, slides are going to show you the correct way to measure length. Take a look at this slide for a moment. You're going to see the club position with the center of the sole touching the ground. Now this is the correct position to register or position the club for length. In this slide, you're going to see the incorrect setup positions, where the sole is resting out near the toe or the heel, and we'll explain why that's important later. Next, we're going to take our 48-inch ruler and place it along the back side of the club with the proper lie angle by the manufacturer, again using the center of the sole as our reference point. Plus, it won't take long to get the hang of this. The tip of the ruler is going to be touching the ground back by the club's heel. Any modern club 
today has a rounded soul in order to uh, effectively play off various lies. So the heel itself will be resting off the ground. Long gone are those days when the soul was flat where you can use the back edge of the heel as a reference point. But a sturdy 48-inch ruler makes a good inexpensive, uh, inexpensive measuring ruler. And there's other types of templates and fixtures available to make measuring length more efficient. And sorry, a yardstick is going to be simply too short to measure club length. I have uh, shown two views on this, on this slide here. The first is a side view as if you were holding the ruler at the end, and the other is a top view of what you might see from behind. Okay, this is important to understand. Even though a person may address the ball with the toe slightly up in the air, we cannot accurately factor that into account, so club length is always referenced in the sole centered position only. The final length is measured to the edge of the grip cap, or at least how I teach it. So where is the edge of the grip cap exactly? Well, in many cases, it's very noticeable where you can feel the edge. But wherever you believe it to be, be consistent. Now, when it comes to length, I think I've heard it all. Some customers have told me on the phone that the, the length of their club was X amount from the end of the grip to the start of that little black thing above the head. Well, unfortunately, the length of the, the grip, the hosel, the ferrule, et cetera, all could differ. So there really is only two reference points that are viable, the ground and the edge of the grip cap. As I alluded to before, if a 48-inch ruler is not positioned correctly, your measurements may not be accurate. Let's say for the sake of argument that we lowered the butt end of the club and subsequently the ruler too. So the club rests out on the heel. This position is considered too flat. Or if the butt end of the club was raised as well as the ruler so the club, uh, the club head rests out on the toe, this position is considered too upright. This is very important. If you set the club with the incorrect lie, then one of two things will occur. First, the club resting on the heel or the ruler positioned too flat, the length you're measuring is going to be shorter than what it should be. Or secondly, the club is resting out on the toe or the ruler is, is positioned too upright, the length that you measure is going to be longer than it should be. Even two degrees one way can amount to um, an eighth of an inch. So even being careful, one could be off as much as a quarter inch or more. While this may not sound like much, it is when we talk about club specifications. And for the record, there's rules regarding the length. According to the USJ, our governing body, the minimum length the club can be is 18 inches. And except for putters, the maximum length is 48 inches. Yes, those are rarities to find, but they're there for a reason. This measuring procedure is used in all cases except for putters that the shaft is not located at the heel, which we'll, we'll discuss next. What makes the putter length different is the attachment of the shaft to the head. In all other clubs, the hosel of the, and, and the shaft are located at the heel of the club. But on a putter, it could vary greatly. It could be located in the heel, and if so, the length is measured just as previously outlined. However, most putters aren't. The hosel on an answer style putter may be inward one inch from the heel. You have center shafted putters where the, the shaft intersects the center of the putter head. And lastly, there have been putters made with the hosel located out near the toe, such as the Bass, Bass Ackwards putter designed by the legendary Jim Flood. But this shouldn't discourage you from measuring the proper length. The key, whether the shaft is straight or curved, is to follow the back side of the shaft like pictured here. For curved shafts, you want to use the upper portion of the shaft as your primary shaft axis. There are other methods used to measure uh, length that I want to make you aware of. Be, because of time constraints today, we won't have time to go over them. But if you go to YouTube and type in Harico, you can uh, look at our October 1, 2009 length measuring webinar. Now we got our housekeeping out of the way. Now we can start to think about the length that might fit you or your customer.
In any given golf bag, you'll see clubs of all different lengths. For example, they may range from, say, a 45-inch driver down to a 34-inch putter. But why? Well, let me give you an analogy. Imagine you, need, you needed to loosen a screw. The first thing you need to do is find an appropriate screwdriver. You may have several different screwdrivers at your disposal to choose from, such as a short stubby one to work in very close quarters, to a long-handled one to reach into deep crevices or when you need more leverage. Obviously, the short stubby screwdriver will be too short in some cases, and the extended length screwdriver will be too cumbersome in other situations. The key is to use the right length tool for the job. So why the concern of selecting the wrong length when the average golfer already has clubs that are close to 11 inches apart? To a certain degree, your body can adapt by tilting from the, the waist, swinging the arms away from the body, and bending the wrist at different angles, as shown here in this diagram. Even someone who picks up a club for the very first time naturally adjusts to the length. Not shown from this angle, but we do spread our legs at a dress to give us a good foundation for us to swing upon. Using a longer club requires a wider stance and, in essence, decreases how tall we stand at a dress. We also do one other thing. Instead of having our legs rigid at a dress, we actually sit or squat down by bending at the knees. Ultimately, this is what gives or creates our balance. The more you tilt at the waist and change your spine angle, the more you have to sit back and bend your knees. Otherwise, you might fall forward. While the first diagram depicted a woman uh, golfer setting up to a driver, this is the opposite, opposite extreme. Now take a look at the change at the angles for a putter. The spine angle of, a, of the driver may have been close to 30 degrees. But for a putter, the golfer's spine angle may be tilted, uh, tilted forward another 10 degrees. Also remember how the arms went away from the body? Well, with the putter, they often go inwards. The importance of this is to get the player's eyes positioned over the ball as taught by many teachers. This is what the blue dotted line you see represents. And the arms may look all bunched up in this diagram. Well, in this case, the arms fall too uh, far down on the grip, so the elbows have to move outward, in essence shortening the arm length. All the other clubs in the set fall somewhere in between these two examples, creating a different position for each club in the set. Now, here are some telltale signs that you have the wrong length clubs. Do you tend to choke or grip down on the club, take large divots, blade or top the ball, or hit near the heel or toe of the face on a regular basis? Well, if you answered yes, then chances are you probably have the wrong length club. It all comes down to comfort and performance. Even though, even though the body can adapt to various lengths. One could easily follow the Goldilocks and the Three Bears principle of fitting. Ask yourself or your customer if your, if your clubs feel too long, too short, or just right. Feel often comes first and foremost as the proper length puts you in a good athletic posture. But when you can't determine which length feels right, then you have to evaluate such performance issues such as solidness of contact, ball trajectory, and direction to guide you. Believe it or not, but a half inch of length one way or another can make the difference between holding a putt, splitting the fairway, to neither of each. Okay, in our next slide, um, we're going to talk about why there's two sets of standard lengths. One is for men, and the other is for women, and this is universal throughout the entire industry. Even though I mentioned our bodies can adapt to different lengths, we at least have two sets of standards to make it more comfortable for women who happen to be sh um, shorter on average than men. In the U.S., the average adult male is roughly 5 foot 10 inches, while the average adult female is approximately 5 foot 4 inches. When you look at the difference in club length between men and women, it's been traditionally one inch difference. 
even though there's a six inch difference in their average height, there's only a one inch difference in club length. There's some other differences as well. Women appear to have longer legs by proportion, but that's only because their spines tend to be a little bit shorter. So what happens if someone's in between these heights? Wouldn't it be safe to assume that there's a, a need for a third set of standards? Furthermore, for taller or shorter individuals, shouldn't the principles of proportionality take over and should suggest that there should be many more categories for length, much the same way that uh, blue jeans are sold? Well, in the world of ready-made or off-the-shelf golf clubs, this formula simply doesn't work. The manufacturers mass produce their stock clubs to fit the average adult male for one length and women for another. A little fun fact here, and manufacturers know this, 68% of all women fall between 5'2 and 5'7, and 68% of men are between 5'6 and 5'11, which is a high percentage to produce only two lengths. Remember our principle of proportionality for every six inches of height equals one inch change in club length. So three inches one way or another is really only a half inch difference. And the manufacturers are banking that you can make those minor adjustments at the waist, arms, and wrist. Now for the 32% that fall outside these ranges, the various manufacturers do offer, uh, offer custom assembly programs with a typical two week turnaround time. This is why local club makers um, building from scratch or fitting the repair centers can make those adjustments on demand after fitting the individual. So let's talk about height-based charts for a moment. The great thing about them is height is height regardless if you're a man or a woman. Using our rule of thumb that for every six inches difference in height is equal to one inch uh, length change, we can extrapolate the following chart. For example, someone six foot five uh, might look at a club that's one inch over men's standard as a starting point. Or a five foot two person, note I didn't say women, although it could be, may, may want to look at an inch and a half under men's standard. Knowing that women's standard length is an inch shorter, then if these were, uh, if this was someone uh, ordering women's clubs, then they would look at a half inch under lady standard lengths as their starting point. These height-based charts are often used in static fitting situations uh, when the player may not be able to hit different length demo clubs as a means of becoming properly fit. Or club fitters will ask this in the personal interview process, again, to give them a starting point in which to conduct the rest of their fitting. Now, height alone shouldn't be the only consideration. Wrist to floor is another measurement that's used to suggest the height or, or, or at least come up with a starting point of um, what length to give a player. This is how it works. The player being fitted uh, stands in street or tennis shoes with their um, feet shoulder uh, width apart and with their arms hanging straight down. Then the fitter is going to carefully measure from the, the, the length from the ground to the crease of the wrist. This is better than fingertip to floor, which was used when I started, because you don't have to factor in the finger length, too. For the average male golfer, the wrist to floor measurement is just shy of half their height, or approximately 49% of the golfer's height. In this slide, you get an understanding of the proportionality. Each figure is three inches taller or shorter than the adjacent figure. The wrist to floor line, which is that blue dotted line you see, doesn't decrease at the same amount or same rate as the change in height. This is the reason why there's a six to one ratio for height to club length. You know, fitting for height would be a lot easier if everybody was proportional, but that's not always the case as you're gonna see. Here's the reason why. 
You may have watched a basketball game where the announcer said that six foot nine forward had the wingspan of someone seven foot four inches. What this means in layman's terms is the player has disproportionately longer arms than their height would indicate. Think about that, or, or think about what an average is. It's a culmination of all the highs and lows, yet we use average, or the mean, as a point of reference all the time. This slide illustrates a player in an athletic posture addressing a six iron. Let me rephrase that for a second. This is the position we want at impact, because at address, the toe may be slightly off the ground. The length of the six iron is 37 and a half inches with a lie angle, 62 degrees, which is fairly typical measurements. Measuring vertically from the uh, edge of the grip or where the crease of the wrist may be to the ground measures 33.11 inches. And this is using simple tr uh, tr trigonometry to come up with these numbers. However, if a player's arms were longer by two-thirds of an inch, as depicted in blue, then the player's arms would dangle lower from the same pivot point on the shoulders and the wrist would be closer to the ground. The golfer has several options in this, in this case, one of which is for that player to maintain his positions or um, would be to grip further down on the golf club. And this would be the same as if the player was using a shorter club. Or they could change their spine angle and stand taller to dress if that felt more comfortable. Again, the player can adjust somewhat to the length of the golf club. However, if the player's arms were shorter by two-thirds of an inch, as depicted in the red, then the player's arms wouldn't dangle as low from the same pivot point on the shoulders, and the wrist would be further uh, away from the ground. In this case, the, customer, or the, the, the golfer may need to hunch over just to grab the uh, club and no longer be in a, a comfortable athletic posture. There are a couple other options, one of which is to use a longer club than the height-based chart might show due to the person's arms are not proportional to the average. Golfers that are used to buying off the rack or want a club immediately and don't want to wait the proverbial two-week uh, turnaround time may seek a third option. And this option is what man, many manufacturers would rather see because changing their length changes the alt, or, or alters the balance or swing weight for their golf clubs. Oftentimes on an iron or wedge, the lie could be altered. For approximately every third of an inch higher or lower the wrist to floor measurement is, the lie of a mid iron to be altered by one degree and maintain our triangle where the center of the sole touches the ground and the player has not had to reposition their hand or body angles. For a driver, it might be closer to half inch per degree, and on a putter, it might be a little less than two tenths of an inch. While the grip could be lowered or raised by altering the lie angle and maintaining a player's posture or spine angle, it does not address another issue. And that's how far we stand away from the ball. By making the lie more upright, it forces us to stand closer to the ball. Otherwise, the impact may end up being on the toe side of the face. If the lie were flatter, it will lower the grip to accommodate the player's longer arms. But the player will also have to stand further away from the ball. Otherwise, the impact could be made in the heel on the face. In this diagram on the right, it shows the result of changing or altering the lie just two degrees in either direction, yet maintaining the same length. You'll see that the vertical rise to the end of the grip changes by more than an inch and a quarter, and the horizontal distance, or how far we stand away, changes by over two inches. And when you think about this for a second, the five iron is a half inch longer than a six iron. The five iron is designed with a flatter lie, and as a result, the spine and arm angles are raised just slightly higher and it forces you to stand away from the ball a little bit further. This is why there's a smooth progression in both length and lie throughout the set. If the lengths and lies don't follow in this progression, 
it'll make it more difficult to make a repeatable stroke to what is already a difficult game. Lie on a iron or wedge can often be adjusted, but usually within plus or minus two degrees of the published specification. This is why I said earlier that the length needs to be factored first as length and lie go hand in hand. And let's say you had a player that needed a specific length, but you have to bend a particular club head three or four degrees to reach your objective. Well, you're better off looking for another iron model with an appropriate starting lie angle instead of risking damage to the head while bending it. While most irons and wedges can be altered, this, is not the only, this isn't the case with all the other clubs for various reasons. For example, the hosel is too short or the insertion depth is too deep, which is the case on most drivers, fairways, and hybrids. And yes, there's adjustable lie drivers and fairways, um, like our Dynacraft Profit ICT, but the options are limited. In cases with uh, putters, some materials aren't bendable uh, without breaking or possess a curved shaft which requires special bending bars and a loft and lie machine. Going back to this diagram, a few years ago I fitted a person who had a birth defect. His arms stopped where a normal person's elbows would be. I want you to think about that for a minute. Any height-based chart would not be able to fit this individual. His clubs would have to be much, much longer just so his club would reach the ball without severely bending over and losing balance and power. And to this day, that was the longest set of clubs I ever made for someone, and he only stood 5 foot 10 inches. On the flip side, I've had tall basketball players with exceptionally long arms who could use today's standard length golf clubs. Another consideration is weight. Um, I had a customer I was helping on the phone to fit one of his clients. Uh, he did the wrist to floor measurement, the height, and so forth. However, the customer would always seem to top the ball if not miss it completely. Well, finally it dawned on me to ask how heavy the customer was, uh, which was kind of embarrassing since he was standing right next to him. But his answer was close to 500 pounds. Well, at that moment, I tried to explain that would be the equivalent of us stuffing a pillow into our shirt and then attempting to hit a ball. And as you can imagine, his clubs needed to be made much longer just so he can swing around his body. Okay. Now this chart builds upon the height-based chart we saw earlier, except for now, we show the proportional wrist to floor measurements and then suggestions for varying the length plus or minus two degrees from standard. Now this chart is not set in stone or the Bible when it comes to height and wrist to floor measurements. Rather, it's just a guideline to show you how this process works. So let's say, for example, we have a golfer that's six foot five with a wrist to floor measurement of 37 and a quarter inches or 37.25 inches. From the chart we can conclude a good starting point is plus one inch over men's standard and standard lie. And that's where my uh, little hand is right here. Oh, there it is. Okay. In another example, let's say we had a six foot one golfer with a wrist to floor measurement of 35 inches. Now let's look at the chart for six foot one golfer. Let's see, there's six one, go across. Well, the average wrist to floor measurement is 35.7 inches. Now this golfer's wrist to floor measurement is seven tenths of an inch shorter, meaning he has dis or she has disproportionately longer arms. As I said earlier, for approximately every third of an inch is a one degree lie change. In this case, we can make the club a half inch longer with a two degree flatter lie. The golfs, or golfers' arms pivot around their uh, shoulders, and in the, in the case of a six iron, um, 
the player swings or player's arms swing away from the body by a few degrees. What we're attempting to do is lower the butt end of the club so the spine angle doesn't have to change or create an imbalance problem. In the lower right hand corner of the slide you see a segment of our length and lie triangle depicting a half inch of length at 62 degrees. The vertical rise of this half inch segment is only 44 hundredths of an inch. Even though the club is a half inch longer or shorter, the butt end of the club would only rise or lower 44 hundredths of an inch. Lie angles other than 62 degrees may vary just slightly. Now using our example, um, we could have the, have the player using a half inch longer six iron and a two degree flat lie, or we can elect to go a half inch shorter or standard length and only one degree flatter lie. And here's the reason why. Somehow we need to drop the butt end of the club seven tenths of an inch shorter by either length, lie, or the combination of the two to accommodate the shorter than average wrist to floor measurement for the golfer's uh, height. Remember the uh, effect from the two degree change from the previous page? By flattening the lie angle two degrees, we took the end of the grip from 33.11 inches down to 32.45 inches, which equals 0.66 inches or two-thirds of an inch change in the vertical rise, and very close to the seven-tenths seven of an inch we're trying to achieve. Now, if we elected to make the club a half inch shorter instead, this would take up 44 hundredths of the 70 hundredths of an inch that um, we're attempting to do. And we will only have 26 hundredths of an inch difference with a lie change, which would be approximately a one degree flatter lie. The point I'm trying to make is the club fitter has options to what length and appropriate lie change at all possible he or she can make to their customer. And again, the reason why this is ground zero when it comes down to fitting. Now this leads us to other factors such as swing weight. Here's some scenarios of length, lie, and swing weight. This table is an example where the lengths are set in uh, quarter inch increments and the lies by six tenths of a degree. If you look at the vertical rise column, the end of the grip would all come up to the same height off the ground. Using a standard weight steel shaft, the swing weights of these six irons may range from, say, D2 for the 38-inch length down to C9 for the 37.5-inch length. If we were using a lighter weight steel um, or even graphite shafts, this would further reduce the swing weight, but at least proportionally. This is why lighter weight graphite shafts are generally made longer to help maintain their balance. It's nearly impossible to alter the length of a club significantly without changing swing weight. A club maker can normally add weight during the assembly po uh, process, but there is a catch. There's a limit to how much the clubs can be increased in weight unless the customer doesn't want a gob of lead tape all over the club. If the weight is too much, most club makers don't want to go through all the hassle of grinding weight from the head which might, only not, or might not only affect the cosmetics, but the playability too. This is why when someone might fall between, or fall under a men's standard half inch or shorter, um, let me rephrase that. Okay, if, if someone's a half inch shorter, then you want, all the clubs to be relative to how the manufacturer set up the club in the first place. And I'll explain this when we get into our next slide. Again, the, the club maker or fitter has options for suggesting a longer or a shorter club as it's not all set in stone. Furthermore, if the player is continually hitting out near the toe of the face, then the longer but flatter lie option would be the better choice as this would push the club further out from the golfer 
and now that golfer may hit closer to the center of the face. And as you can see, when you change this one specification like length, it sets off a whole chain of events. So you want to weigh your options accordingly. The, the reason why each club is a different length and even lie has to do with head weight, with the longer club having a lighter weight head. The relationship between length and head weight is also tied to creating so-called standard swing weights or a swing weight range. On this slide happens to be Perico's standard length chart. I should note that each and every manufacturer or component supplier has their own chart uh, that may vary uh, from this. This is why we go the extra route and add head weights uh, or head weight column as a precautionary measure when you might be working with another manufacturer's club. It's impossible to go over every scenario we have or in, in, um, in the time we have left today, um, but let me explain how component selection ties into length. For starters, you just can't pick any old uh, head before knowing what length you want it. Let's say you and you co or your customer wanted an ultra-long uh, driver, such as 46 inches or longer. Well, you may need, or I should say want, a lighter weight head so it doesn't feel too head heavy. An example would be our 190 gram Acer XF Legera, which didn't even exist six months ago. On the flip side of the spectrum, you or your customer may not be able to handle a longer driver or even standard length for, um, for that matter. You may need to find select heads that are weighted for shorter assembly lengths, like our Acer XDS Insider Thriver, or in fairway woods, the Cayman Raw Power 3 wood, which is weighted as a 5 wood to help increase the, 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 the player's solidness of contact percentage. It used to be commonplace to see fairway woods like the 3, 5, and 7 to be made in length progressions of one inch between each club. But that's not a given anymore as today. Many OEMs have adopted half-inch gaffs in some of their lines, essentially creating what used to be the 3, 4, and 5 wood set. Their head weights uh, may weigh accordingly in those situations. Hybrids, well, they can be found in a myriad of different weights, uh, which gives several fitting options. While some hybrids are the same weight as the corresponding numbered irons, others might be 7 grams or 14 grams lighter than the same numbered irons. In those cases, they're suggested to be assembled a half inch and one inch uh, respectively longer than the iron of the same number. On top of that, the length between successive hybrids may not be a half inch anymore. You're starting to see some of the OEM's hybrids progress throughout the set by three quarters of an inch increment, and their head weights are going to be altered to allow for standard swing weights. So someone's sensitive to using longer lengths. By selecting a lighter hybrid at a shorter length, you may not, as an end result, have sufficient head weight. Wedges could also pose a challenge. Let's say you want progressively shorter wedges as you drop down from 52, 56, 60, and even 64 degree lofts. You want to look at heads that are also progressively heavier weighted. However, if you prefer your wedges to be all the same length, then you might want to look at um, head weights that are relatively close to one another. And in putters, shorter or long chest putters really require heavier head weights, thus eliminating many possibilities to choose from. And if longer or shorter than normal length um, lengths are in order, then that may force the uh, club fitter to take a closer look at shaft weight. Going shorter and also using a lighter weight shaft can create some uh, swing weighting issues, just as much as going longer and using heavier weight shafts unless that person has the strength for it. And of course, you can't pick out a grip before you know what shaft um, you're going to use because the butt diameter might be different and that might reduce your number of choices. 
So you can see how shaft length becomes ground zero when selecting the components you need to build that custom club that's going to give you or your customer their best performance. One of the fundamental rules is to use the length that feels the most comfortable to you, regardless of whether a height-based chart or a wrist-to-floor chart stated otherwise. A friend of mine made this driver up for a female customer who ended up never stopping by to pick it up. A well, long story short, he was so mad that he made up the driver and wasn't going to get paid for it, he decided to take it out and use it himself. To give you a little background, my friend is tall and a very long ball hitter. The last thing he needed was a 42-inch ladies flex driver. But the funny part is he nailed that driver and it was in his bag for several years. And to this day, he still wishes he had kept it. Over the past two decades, I've used clubs of various lengths. At six foot two, I've used standard length only because many of the clubs that I make up need to be handed to golfers that are shorter than I to try. And I've also played lengths as long as an inch and a half longer than standard and everything in between. So I have a good idea of what I need. Now some club makers will alter the length of their builds just so they uh, come out with a so-called standard swing weight. But don't make that mistake of forsake, forsaking the length the customer needs only to achieve a certain swing weight, because that's the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish in custom fitting. And if you're choking or gripping down on the golf club and don't like the smaller grip size, there's no reason why you shouldn't use the shorter uh, club. And if you're concerned with swing weight, don't worry. You've been simulating what the club would feel like at the shorter length anyway. Now, demo clubs are a great way of finding out quickly what you need um, or what your customer should use. This is the preferred method for finding out the exact length one needs. For club fitters, make up the same head like a mid-iron, but have several different length shafts of the same type and flex, and make sure the grips are all the same too. By having your customer hit balls, you can isolate just one parameter, in this case length. Plus, you can also use those clubs to fit for a lot. Or instead of making several clubs, you can use something like our quick fit system. This is where you have gripped shafts of various lengths epoxied into special adapters and then these could be screwed into one head for your customers to hit, eliminating all the other variables. You'll hear more about our quick fit system shortly. But whichever method you use, make sure to clearly label the shaft so you know what you're handing to your customer. Next, we want to speak about performance. There are ways of telling if you have the wrong length or not, aside from the obvious signs of topping the ball or taking huge divots prior to hitting the ball. By the way, the first one can be remedied by using a slightly longer club and the other by a slightly shorter one. The key is to look closely at impact. If shots are all over the face, this could indicate the wrong length along with all sorts of other maladies. But shots hit consistently out near the uh, toe or heel, but not both may be remedied by a uh, change in length or possibly lie. We have a, a product called Market um, Impact Spray. And it, as the name uh, indicates, it's a, it's a spray you can apply to the face of the club to see where you're hitting the ball. We also have impact decals uh, that you can put on the face to, to do the same thing. In this picture here, you can see that the impacts are clearly not in the center or just above the center of the face on these drivers. Most drivers can't be altered for lie unless you have a removable adapter like the Dynacraft Profit ICT. So we know something is amiss here. Now in an iron, you might need only to test for one club, again like a mid-iron, and then build the rest of the set around the length of the demo club you hit best. Well, this is the end of our webinar today, so let me recap. Length of clubs vary throughout the set, 
to give you more leverage or speed, as in the case of a driver, and as the clubs become shorter, give you more precision and control. Length becomes the, the key factor for setting you the correct distance uh, from the ball. And that allows one to make a balanced and a repeatable swing that hopefully will culminate in the player hitting the sweet spot of the club. Length is also tied directly to the lie. In turn, length affects swing weight. So selecting a non-standard length may influence the, the, uh, the weight or type of shaft you need, which in turn may affect grip selection and size. As you can see, no other parameter touches so many others than length. Now, let's turn this back over to Rob in the time remaining today to answer your questions. Great job, Jeff. Thank you so much. All right, guys, you can type your questions in the question box in your dashboard on the upper right-hand corner, and we'll get to them. Just want to make a quick announcement here. Jeff has spent the past, gosh, years rewriting the Modern Guide to Club Fitting club making book. The modern guide to club making book is now available in four color. It's been in black and white for the past 20 years. He spent years rewriting it. It is all modern, uh, four color, available for $29.95, and it, it is at the printer now and will be available next week. So you'll be getting an email uh, announcing its arrival, but just as a uh, FYI that Jeff's rewritten the modern guide to club making, which is a great book. Okay, so Norman's got a question. When a, when a customer does not have the skill to reliably strike the center of the face in any case, how do you use face impacts to judge proper club length? Um, what I like to do in that case, and, and I know where you're coming from because I've, I've, I've stood in those shoes, I would look at the, the where it's clustered best and use that as a guide, but also ask your customer how it feels, and uh, to kind of sit back and, and, and look to see if, if the player has a good athletic posture, if they're bent over too far or, or um, standing too erect, that could be a, a, a real reason for them not making an impact in the center. All right, great. Just ask your questions, guys. We've got a few more minutes left here. If not, we can wrap it up here. Just wait a few more moments here, Jeff, see what the question's coming in. All right, a question from Gabriel. Depending on the golf instructor, it seems that the angle of the arm is also a big factor. For example, some say to keep the elbow down. Others say to take your natural arm position. Any comments? Um, well, that, that's where comfort becomes a key. Um, I, I've never been one to possess that there's one right way to swing a golf club, because obviously you can look at the PGA or the Champions Tour and see a gazillion different swings out there. It's whatever, um, it, to me, the, the clubs are tools. The, the golfer is probably not going to change the their their swing uh, without a lot of practice. So you want to make the clubs fit the golfer instead of the golfers fitting the, the, the player. So I look at those as two independent factors. All right, Norbert asks, what lengths would you recommend for making the demo clubs? Um, on lengths, I would probably go, and again, you can use like a mid iron and drivers. Obviously, standard um, plus one inches, minus one inches, maybe even a plus two, depending on the the, the clientele that you get in. Um, you could go in half inch increments as well, but uh, you could take your inch longer and have the person choke down a half an inch uh, to simulate that as well. If you wanted to cut down on the the number of uh, demos, so there's there's plenty of options, but uh, right. Usually, um, probably no more than two inches. I doubt you'd run into too many cases, and probably not more than two inches shorter. All right, Norman asks, would you say that improper club length is more of a problem for a golfer than improper swing weight? Oh, by far, yeah. It, I think swing weight, to a certain degree, is overblown. I, I would rather have the, the length 
correct and the swing weight being off. Uh, most golfers probably can't tell the difference between plus or minus three swing weights anyway. Um, and especially when you get into stuff like back weighting and whatever. Oh, but by far, make sure that the, the uh, um, yeah, don't, don't forsake swing weight for length. Length is the number one uh, fitting parameter. Gary asks, when will the quick fit system be available? <laughs> I think some of it came in um, today or yesterday. Um, I, I got to work with Rob in setting up like uh, the how-to. That's probably going to be our next webinar. Plus next week you'll get an email. Well, I'm going to be, well, actually tomorrow I'm going to be notifying you on the big shipment that came in yesterday. Some of the XF, XF hybrids came in, some of the fairways. You'll get a note tomorrow on uh, what just came in, but a large shipment did just come in. All right, Dale asks, if the impact tape shows center high or center low, is that indicative of a length or lie angle problem? Um, if it's on a driver, it could be T height, or it could be it could be length. Um, what I would probably suggest in that situation, if it's a, it, it, it's not random, but it's a repeating pattern where it's normally high or normally low, but not both, is to have that player choke down or grip down half an inch on the club and see if it doesn't make it better. Um, again, that's the, the difference I was talking about, that half an inch is the difference between splitting the fairway and not. Norbert asks, should there be a different demo set for women and men? Yes, because uh, you're probably going to want different shafts uh, in them, because with your lady customers, you probably want you know, a ladies flex shaft and an appropriate grip size. But it's not okay. saying that you won't be able to uh, to, to use those you know, universally, you may have to find men that might need the shorter length and may prefer this smaller grip size too. So it gives you several more options. Frank asks, are you using a lie board in your fittings? Um, I, um, when I was doing a lot of fittings, we did use lie board in conjunction with the length test clubs, at least for the irons, and then uh, also maybe for the wedges too. Great. All right, Jeff, that's a wrap. It's getting close to two, and uh, GoToWebinar only uh, allows us to be recording for an hour, so we're getting close to our end here. Guys, thanks so much for um, attending today. Be on the lookout next week for the Modern Guide to Club Fitting, available in four color. That's going to be out, and we thank you again. Any other words, Jeff? Thank you all for attending today. Great. Have a good Easter weekend, guys. See ya. Bye-bye.